In the year 1186 AD, King Parakramabahu the Great, King of the Three Sinhalese Kingdoms, passed away after 33 years of impressive rule, leaving his nephew Vijayabahu the Poet as his heir. Vijayabahu's ineffectiveness was soon noted by the royal clans of the three Sinhalese kingdoms and the island was immediately engulfed in inevitable civil war. Backed by South Indian ally kingdoms, each only interested in their own geopolitical gain, the three Sinhalese kingdoms warred between each other, a suitable prelude to the invasion of Maga of Kalinga and the final fall of the kingdom of Polonnaruwa. Hidden in this cruel tale of thrones, kings and power is the strategy of Queen Lilavati, Queen Regent of King Parakshnabahu the Great. The Indian subcontinent and Central Asia were the center of ancient global economy. Many North Indian kingdoms engaged in international trade via an overland caravan network between China and the Middle East, known as the Silk Road. Along with increased maritime exploration and better knowledge of Indian Ocean trade winds, a maritime trade network began to operate between the Middle East and China as an alternative to the Silk Road. Many South Indian and Sri Lankan kingdoms tapped into the Maritime Silk Road and prospered from the profits gained through this network of trade. Right before the Pax Mongol, maritime trade peaked between 1000 AD to 1200 AD. Many kingdoms focused their trade to ports and trade fleets instead of the caravan routes of Central Asia, making Maritime Silk Route a global network of valuable cross-country trade. With the increase of trade volume and profits, rose the first and only South Indian Empire in history, known as the Chola Empire. The Cholas militarily defeated its neighboring kingdoms, and stretched their influence as far as the Ganges River in the north and the islands of Sumatra in Southeast Asia. This proto-imperialist power soon saw resistance from its conquered subject kings following a series of over-expansive policies and weak rulers which shook the foundations of the Chola Empire. Many of its subject regions formed alliances with each other to repel Chola power and soon gained independence from the empire. Nevertheless, containing Chola power in the Indian Ocean Seas and South India was crucial to the survival of these independent kingdoms who, in the face of a common enemy, pledged cooperation by all necessary means. Soon, some of these kingdoms suppressed the Cholas militarily and also strengthened their diplomatic relations through trade agreements and royal marriages between these ethnic-based kingdoms. By the end of 12th century AD, Chola presence and power was challenged severely by alliances between Pandyans, Sinhalese and Kalingans. Towering over a weakened common foe, the allied kingdoms saw opportunity in waging proxy wars between each other, which soon led to administrative interferences between different royal dynasties and often took a brutal approach to maximize power in foreign regions. The Cholas had left a solid example of imperialism to be followed. These geopolitical developments were to become deadly for Polonnaruwa Kingdom. 
its three provinces, namely Rajarata, Lakhinadesa, and Ruhuna, had experienced decentralized power after the fall of its predecessor, the kingdom of Anuradhapura. In the conflict that followed the reunification of the island, one prince succeeded in subduing the other provinces militarily and shown in Sri Lankan history as one of its greatest kings. His name was King Parakramabahu. King Parakramabahu was known in history as a great king because of his energetic reign and effective politics. King Parakramabahu was known in history as a great king because of his energetic reign and effective policies in the areas of military, agriculture and religion. It is in Parakramabahu's early life story do we first see record of his cousin, Princess Leelawati from the kingdom of Ruhuna. Leelawati's parents were King Sri Vallava and Queen Sugala of the Principality of Ruhuna who were aunt and uncle of the then prince Parakramabahu. There are no detailed accounts of Princess Leela with his early life or marriage to Parakramabahu at all. However, her brother Manaburana and mother Sugala had a difficult relationship with Parakramabahu. Manaburana fought Parakramabahu on several occasions while Queen Sugala is known to have led regional uprisings against Parakramabahu. It is impossible to imagine what role Leelavati played in this aggressive political scheming between her husband and her family. The kingdom of Polonnaruwa was again engulfed in a brutal struggle for power following the death of Parakramabahu in 1186 AD. From 1186 AD to 1215 AD, there were 13 kings and queens appointed often by warlords of the kingdom who used military power to execute kings on the throne. The political instability of the time is clearly marked by constant struggle for power by South Indian royal houses such as the Eastern Ganga dynasty. These times saw Queen Lilavati crowned at three separate occasions as restorations of the true heir of Parakramabahu. Each occasion was supported by local warlords and ultimately failed to succeed in the wrong run. It is without doubt that Queen Lilavati was at the time a last hope for the continuation of Parakramabahu's lineage in the eyes of many and repeated restorations by different powerful figures point out to the same fact. However, it must be noted how the author of Chulavamsha, who is the main source of this history, chooses to sway his prose sometimes in favor of and at other times against Queen Lilavati's different reigns without clear reasoning. The credibility of Chulamsha's author may be questioned on the basis of biased interpretation, but who he was biased for is a matter for discussion. It can be said with confidence that the author of Chulavamsha may have been expected to support Queen Leelavati as the last remaining heir of King Parakramabahu, who was a great patron of the Buddhist monastery at which the chronicle was being written at. If so, Chulavamsha breaks the tradition of the heroic patron lineage it had followed previously, all the while giving rise to the suspicion of a different, hitherto unknown heir to the throne of King Parakramabahu. Alternatively, considering the last prose on Queen Leelavati being written in favor of her, it can be argued that the Chulavamsha author had been alienated by who held the real power of Queen Leelavati. It makes sense to look at Queen Leelavati as a proxy of whoever supported her claim to the throne. And Chulavamsha always makes note of a powerful general or minister who facilitated the restoration attempts of Queen Leelavati. This may be a sensible way of informing the reader on who held the true power at the royal court. If this is true, Queen Leelavati would have been seen only as an accomplice of a general or a minister. If so, Queen Leelavati's disarraying character continuity may only be a depiction of the intention of her facilitator. Hence, the tradition of heroic patron lineage of Chulavamsha may have continued in the form presented notwithstanding the negative assumptions formed of a cursory glance. Queen Leelavati's survival in a royal court full of traitors and murderers with vested interests at great inconvenience to her many usurpers may be due to the high respect she gained as the first lady of King Parakramabahu 
which would have made her the highest ranking female in the royal court, known as First Mahesi. It is possible that her death would have been taken by public ranks as a treason of highest degree, paving way for her continued survival and attempts at re-ascension. Her tale abruptly ends with the final usurper who came from Madurai of Pandey Kingdom and is not mentioned again at all. It is unlikely that she was executed by the Pandyans who were great allies of King Parakramabahu himself. However, the tyrannical Marga from Kalinga who sacked the city of Ulastipura in 1215 AD may well have ended the swan song of a dynasty which took pride in being the liberators of an island people.